So we'll make a start. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Effective Communication and Framing for Heritage Projects. I'm Bev Gormley, um, and I'm the Programme Manager at the Heritage Trust Network. I think most of you will have met me before. Um, and we're the UK's umbrella body for non-profit organisations that are rescuing, restoring and managing historic buildings and places. This is one of the last few um, events that we're running in partnership with Stir to Action and Locality that supports the Architectural Heritage Fund's Transforming Places Through Heritage Initiative and Funding Scheme. Um, and your workshop leader this morning is Daniel Daniel Stanley, who I'll hand over to shortly, but just first a little bit of housekeeping that most people are used to. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box, say where you are, um, what the weather's like, we always like to know, um, and to use the reaction button that should be at the bottom of your screen, depending on what sort of device uh, you're using. So please do test out if it's working now. If you could try giving me a thumbs up or a smiley face or any little reaction, it's nice to see that it, it's all working. Hey, we've got a party going on where Sally is. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, you might see that on your screen um, when you joined, it said that we were live streaming. Don't worry. Lots of thumbs up there. Um, don't worry. We're not live streaming to social media or anything like that. It just means that Otter AI that we use for our live speech to text transcripts is working. Um, feel free to give that a try as well. You just click on the little red live button according to which device you're using it again, um, and you'll see um, what everybody's saying come up on your screen. It just helps some people. Um, you can pose questions in the chat box and I'll keep an eye on them, uh, but Daniel will give you opportunities to ask questions during the session and at the end. And that's enough from me, so I'll hand over to Daniel. Good morning, Daniel. Thanks, Beverly. Yeah, thanks, everyone, Beverly, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of what needs to be said at the beginning has been covered already, so I'll, I'll get straight into it, I think, and, and I'll, um, that includes telling you a little bit more about my background and, uh, yeah, explaining a bit more about what we're going to um, do today. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, one of the downsides of that is that I, I won't be able to see the chat as easily. So if there's a delay in in um, responding to something in the chat, my apologies, but I think Beverly's going to kind of really make sure I, I see anything that comes up. But do feel free to ask questions as we go. And I'm very happy to kind of um, stop and, and kind of discuss certain points. You don't need to wait till, till the end of any point. Um, I definitely think that the you know, given all the different sort of perspective and experience we have in the room, a big thing I'm trying to do today is kind of get you to hear from each other as well as for me. I don't certainly don't pretend to have all the answers on this topic. And um, yeah, so I think especially as, as each of you are sort of working on, I'm guessing a lot of you at least are working on kind of individual um, building projects rather than, um, yeah, you know the overall kind of work that we've been doing that there's certainly things that that you'll bring that, that i don't have as much perspective on so so really keen to, to bring your your experience into this um the other thing i'd probably say at the beginning is we are going to be doing breakout rooms we've got a couple of, of sessions where we'll be doing that and there's always a little bit of a trade-off there in terms of how much how many people in how many breakout rooms with how much time to talk to each other and then how much time to come back and say what you've been saying and so We'll be playing that a little bit by ear. Um, yeah, so the timings, well, I'll just keep an eye on. But but yeah, I I very much encourage you in those breakout rooms. And I will probably repeat this to be succinct and try and give everybody a chance to, to speak because you probably won't get as long as you'll feel like you need to actually cover the subject. You know, I, I, any time I've been in them, I've always felt like you get brought back very abruptly. And that certainly seems to be the experience that most people have. Um, but hopefully you'll get a chance to start to, to discuss stuff and then come back um yeah but with no further sort of intro i'll get straight into start of the session yeah so this is our rough agenda for today as i say i think this will be subject to a bit of change in uh depending on on what we need to, uh, to spend time on hopefully we'll be able to get into the kind of initial first presentation quite quickly because i think given the numbers, if we can do introductions in the chat, as Beverly suggested, that's probably more realistic than everybody going around and choosing themselves. Um, 
yeah so uh, so hopefully we'll get to this first session a little bit earlier we'll see how it goes with the break i suspect again we may not have only it's only a couple of hours i think we can probably survive without one but maybe we'll get a couple of minutes after the end of the first session just to go and grab a drink and stuff um yeah and then ideally if possible it would be very helpful for me if we could finish a few minutes early so i'll do my best to do that certainly i won't won't uh remove any any content that's planned for this but I, I do need to ideally go and pick my daughter up at, at 12 p.m just across the road but um so if we could finish for two minutes too that would be super helpful but I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do um yeah so just kind of reiterating the reason we're here hopefully this is in line with your expectations and what was um sort of set out in the description of this session um you know we definitely kind of just start in the first half by looking at the the kind of negative side, I suppose, at least in terms of like, what are some of the the big barriers? What are kind of some of the the challenges that people you can face when you're trying to to put a you know, heritage project out there and, and increase its kind of awareness and, and interest in it? Um, we're going to look at like then obviously what what can be done about kind of overcoming some of those barriers and, and why it's important to know about them, and then. Yeah, or hopefully in the course of doing that, and then also you know, at the end, we'll have a chance to kind of share individual experiences that we've had. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you on like you know, what what I might have missed in terms of some of the things. I definitely don't think it will be covering everything, um, but also like whether it chimes with some of your experiences and examples you've got of some of those challenges. That will be really helpful, I'm sure, to, to me and, and to each of you. So just very briefly, a bit on my background. So. Yeah, as it says there, um, I grew up in mid Wales. I'm not sure if anyone calls it that who isn't from there particularly, but it's the big empty bit in the middle of Wales, as the name suggests. Um, yeah, not a huge amount going on there. Some heritage. Um, Robert Owen was born in, in the place I grew up, Newtown. Um, but I, I moved out uh, straight to Sheffield for university as soon as I could and was there for eight years before moving down to London. Um, and yeah, I've worked in quite a few different fields, but kind of started out in in kind of quite grassroots level, kind of community organising and, and um, community forum I was working with in Sheffield, um, working with refugees and migrants, asylum seekers there as well, um, and kind of moved sort of accidentally kind of got into communications and then got more and more interested in that. And then that's been my sort of professional focus ever since. Um, I started and ran a digital agency after moving down to London that worked in the sort of non-profit sector. But then I've kind of particularly moved on from that towards less the technical side of stuff, although we still do do projects like that, but more towards that question of like, well, why are we saying, what are we saying and how, or like how can we maybe expand the reach of the people who are responding to what we're saying by by um, adjusting and improving on it. Um, and that's the focus of Cohere, which is communications, agency the main sort of body of the work i'll be talking about today was work that cohere has done over the last few years um and then we have a sort of non-profit research initiative called future narratives lab um which looks at sort of bigger topics um that maybe aren't the responsibility of one organization um and then i also do a little bit of different individual sort of consultancy and and, and work with organizations because that gives me a chance sometimes to do things i couldn't as easily do through a whole organization um more kind of individual bits of work um that includes sort of the work I do with stir to action and courses like this and other things so um yeah that's kind of an increasing part of my work which I'm enjoying but yeah the big piece of work that I'll be talking about mainly today is that we're uh, through Cohere we've been working with Architectural Heritage Fund um for now I think it could even be up to five years but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but as I say, I'm very aware that, um, you know, what we're doing for them is in the same area and it's about helping to kind of make the case for heritage and for heritage projects and why they're important. And a lot of that is then taking the case studies of these individual projects and saying why people should be interested in them and what they represent. But it's not exactly the same thing as sort of supporting individual projects with it. So you know where there are gaps that's the reason and I'm very keen to hear from you on the things you think are and aren't relevant about what we've learned um and see that so introductions wise this is the bit we can slightly skip by in the sense I'm just going to say please type into the chat if you haven't already who you are you know what organization you're from in what area of the country 
Um, and then, yeah, I think if there's any particular challenges you've seen in from a kind of communications point of view, I suppose, in, in persuading people of the value of your project or of heritage or particularly good examples, um, probably won't be able to go through those as much as I'd like to at this point. But um, yeah, do add those in if you can. And then obviously they'll be available and something we can potentially um, gather together and, and share afterwards. But yeah, so that will be going on hopefully in the chat um, alongside, but I'll get straight into the first bit of the presentation and then we'll go from that into breakout rooms fairly soon where we you, know, you can kind of feedback on on what what I've said and your thoughts um might be a good idea I've I've found in respect when you are kind of transitioning from presentation especially the first one straight into a breakout room I'd encourage you to sort of like note down your thoughts as you go and maybe also because there's a bit where I'm going to tell you the kind of main questions otherwise I think sometimes you can find yourself sort of dumped in the breakout room and then just be like what is it we're supposed to be doing what have I just heard and like so I think it's quite useful to take a few notes if you can um, just to sort of get the conversation going um yeah so as I said the first bit of this hopefully that's all clear if there are any major questions pop them in as we go pop them in the chat um but the first bit of this is to sort of try and highlight some of the the major kind of challenges and barriers as we experienced them and as we sort of identified in our work um and you know to see how relevant they are to you um so as i said um we've been working with AH AHF for quite a while um we worked with them sort of initially on looking just at their overall how do they describe what they do and how do they present some of their work but most recently and our kind of most intense work with them has been over the last two to three years um on the transforming places through heritage program so i imagine a fair number of the projects here will be in some ways high streets related but obviously i'm sure there are a lot that aren't as well um this was a high streets focused project but i've hopefully tried to take um conclusions that can also be relevant elsewhere from it um yeah and the kind of the work we did there was to look at that program and, and the projects it supported and and think about how can HF not only support them to success through the funding that it was able to distribute um but also kind of help showcase that work and like build the case for that for supporting those sort of projects to government you know through media to other sort of potentially um important decision makers like funders and so on so I'm guessing those are kind of some of uh, reasonably similar kind of audiences you might be look, looking to reach obviously there's also the public and so on um I think a fair amount of the things that we found and and some of the approaches we'll talk about in the second section should be hopeful should be useful for most audiences but um again very keen to hear your feedback on sort of what maybe these things aren't relevant to or what your um what other audiences need to be considered from a sort of individual project um case so yeah I'll talk through the different things we did in more detail in the next section but um yeah that's just sort of an overview of where this is coming from um and the approach we take at Cohere um when we're kind of starting a communications project is to sort of make sure go through this sort of very typical communications agency three-step methodology that we all have um look at the kind of try and make sure we've got a real clarity about all of the context to what's being discussed um, I think the second point I would say is probably the most important one, as you'll see, which is that we were really keen to always try to, you know, not jump too quickly into the point of of let's create something good and new and better, but but actually to make sure we really understand what the problem is in the first place and and surface the things that are actually the problem underneath like lying, the kind of tensions and barriers as we described them there, um, and I'll give some examples of those in a minute. Um, and then that's what allows us to do something that's genuinely kind of can can uh, make a difference in terms of of how effective your communications is. Um, but yeah, so that's just the kind of general methodology. Um, and you know, I think the most obvious thing you know, you'd be aware of uh, in terms of heritage is the kind of preconceptions that people have about that word, but also about the sort of area of work of heritage, which is like the I think these are the main. A bunch of the main photos that come up when you when you search heritage on google so it's just a visual illustration of like there is a sense in which 
people think it means the sort of big grand old traditional buildings stately homes sort of castles and so on and this is you know the, the people are very aware that this is an issue within the heritage sector and obviously they did really do a lot to overcome this but it's i think it highlights that you one of the big barriers that we saw was people have kind of preconceptions about what you're doing that you have to be really aware of and look to overcome and, and that there's this initial sense in which heritage is the domain of the kind of um ornate and sort of traditional and 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 big um but there's also other ones that we kind of came across and that's what I'll, what I'll talk through a bit now yeah so there are two I've sorted these into kind of two categories they're definitely overlapping um but um the first of them you know that when we were thinking about wanting particularly people to see the work that HF was doing and the projects it was funding as important to the future of high street i think um a, a major challenge there was this question of how do you take a collection of really diverse individual projects that each have their own kind of totally unique story and that's the kind of the na very nature of them how do you kind of collect them together and tell one aggregate thing again now we know that's not necessarily what you're doing but that was kind of where this came from and i think Understanding why that was tricky and the different reasons that were tricky helped surface a number of things, which I think are um, issues that that I think most heritage attempts to kind of take heritage into the mainstream and convey its value will will come up against. So I think the first most obvious one of them is like, you know, when you're talking about the the kind of the history of the building and of something as as having value because of its history, that inherently is going to make it you have to make more effort then to make it feel like this is something which is going to be changing the future of the place. You know, you, it's not that it can't be done at all, but it's just that extra bit of effort to take it out of a discussion about, okay, well, that was about the past, you know, something that happened before rather than being about what we're considering now, you know, does it feel like it's of now? Um, that obviously depends partly on the kind of different usages that you might be putting the building to some of those are more obviously kind of very relevant but I think there is a tendency obviously to sort of it to feel like something um you know like a museum perhaps and then it's uh, important to kind of have that in mind um definitely I think we came across um particularly in thinking about like media coverage that there was a tendency for journalists and and outlets to look at heritage as being something that was really a kind of nice to have kind of charitable arts endeavor that it was something that you know you'd philanthropists would sort of back out of the goodness out of their hearts but it wasn't something that you you know saw as as part of the discussions about you know what was going on in the local economy and and that was a challenge for us with high streets particularly because as we'll talk about in a minute the high streets discussion is one about economics it's like national economics it's about you know numbers of um shops closing across the country percentages of drop in footfall and things like this and um because you know heritage as an area and sort of heritage buildings tended to be seen as like not really part of that discussion and part of this other domain of kind of arts and, and those are the sort of areas of the paper it tended to appear in um it yeah there was an extra effort needed to make it relevant to those discussions and I think when trying to kind of um present these projects to say funders or to other types of um or local government I suppose but particularly we were thinking like national government in terms of policy or, or journalists writing about high streets you know you it's important to recognize that there's an extra effort to be made there because there's a tendency to see these things as not really significant in or kind of economic to economic questions and that you know that crosses over a lot into this next point is that you know there is a sense that these things are um as they are often you know because they're important parts of a local community that they're really of local significance um and not something that you could say is happening nationally and i think that that kind of again this, these are all interrelated but there's there's a very there's a specific thing that challenge i think with heritage projects when you are trying to say heritage as an approach or you are trying to say this is something that could be 
nationally significant and sort of in aggregate it's really tricky because the very thing that makes them special is that they're all unique and that they're all from each kind of particular area and have a kind of particular story to tell so once you try and sort of merge those together and say what is unique about all all of them together you know it, it, you kind of lose something of the kind of thing that makes them special so I think that was a kind of core challenge that we identified there across those sort of last three points um of you know how do we retain the kind of the value that we see in them and, and be but be able to convey it in an aggregate way um yeah and finally I think again and this is but again perhaps more of a, a challenge when thinking about the putting them all together and as a package but you know it is um I don't think there's a lot of awareness of just how many heritage buildings there are across the country and what a re opportunity that represents, you know, um, and we'll, we'll talk about why sometimes it's not seen as an opportunity in a minute. But yeah, that was definitely something that we've struggled with and we continue to because I think the data is not fantastic on this either. And there, there is, there's sort of data on at risk buildings, but in terms of understanding just how many kind of amazing buildings heritage building there are all over the country that could be transformed and, and used into sort of um, put into more innovative uses and what difference that could then make to the country as a whole that's not something that's clearly understood and that perhaps um, means there's not as much investment as there could be into these into these buildings yeah hopefully those are all clear um so yeah this is this is a slide that which I took from from actually the strategy that we put together originally and, and sort of says a lot of the same things but kind of I think boils it down into like that question of like when we were trying to say we want to influence the way that the the government and funders are thinking about the problem of high streets um where is the challenge in terms of making heritage part of that conversation i guess and that's where you know it's where the funding was and where some of the funding is you know so i think you can see how you know there's there's a there's an, a whole set of associations and, and assumptions about these two areas and um, obviously there's exaggeration here in each case but like this is why why it's difficult you know this is why it doesn't land straight away if you're trying to kind of pitch to say that these things are connected um and that yeah we kind of very early on we were clear that this, this was one of the barriers that needed to be looked at and, and and we need to be very aware of in designing what we were doing um yeah and then so the second set of 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 challenges i'll talk about are maybe less to do with the sort of influencing kind of policy and, and thinking about um the relevance of these projects to sort of contemporary debates and more about I think kind of inherent issues that are are challenging about communicating um in this area and, and maybe closer to what you might have experienced um with individual projects so I think there's a you know the fact that there's a building at the heart of these things is just a pretty basic point is um I think that you know there's real pros and cons and and, and if we're talking about challenges I think you know the cons of that are that that can tend to become dominant in how it's sort of presented and discussed there's sort of a, you know every, everything's about the building as a, as a thing as an object and um you know visually sometimes the buildings are often the buildings are really beautiful and unique but there's only so many photos of a building that can be interesting you know it, it can be very it can become a kind of sometimes a bit like of a of a barrier to people really really engaging with other aspects of the project sometimes is, is what we've seen um and yeah again the thing just to, to have in mind um I think there's also and this you know this is something we certainly interacted with in relation to high streets and, and in thinking about getting people to sort of believe in the positive potential of these projects is that for a lot of people um it's difficult for them to envisage um, a big building as being contributing wealth and, and prosperity to an area as it can when it's being used and that there's an assumption that it's always inherently a kind of drain on resources something that will need lots of ongoing income to support it now of course a lot of places do need <laughs> some ongoing income to support it need some form of income to support it and to pay the bills but the assumption that it's it's 
yeah, I, I maybe that's just a general pessimism in the economic climate, but I think that there's a there's a challenge that people start from the point of view that that it's it's hard to it's really maybe even unrealistic to expect um, that you can just take a building that was once say der derelict and turn it into a prosperous thing that's self sustaining. And so I think kind of really we'll talk about later really evidencing that you have to kind of get past that assumption sometimes with people for them to then feel enthusiastic about it because otherwise it can seem sort of slightly slightly idealistic to believe to people that that's possible um you know and then a lot of people will have experienced of course as well buildings shutting down and shop fronts closing and so on and, and so they're sort of reading of how difficult it is to make a sort of sustainable um project or business out of a out of a building on the high street or elsewhere will be taken from that um yeah i think that the sometimes there's a tendency in which kind of buildings can be um you know there is a sense of very basic level in which a kind of building is is not if it's focusing on the building it's a sort of static thing it's not something which is necessarily kind of creative it's not sort of showing um to sort of have that energy of like if you're focusing on a group of people or on a project that has a kind of ambition at the end of it or whatever and obviously generally speaking heritage projects are a combination of those things but when you are talking mainly about the building again like that sense of it going somewhere is not necessarily as present as it could be and that's you know something that you can address in terms of emphasizing other elements um yes and i said the same before i think particularly it is challenging to get across that sense of this is exciting and it can happen and it's going to succeed and you should want to be part of it when you're dealing with an area where people are seeing a lot of difficulty and decline and 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 you're seeing all sorts of kind of negative stories and i think it's even to the point now where there's just an assumption that the high street is dying and will you know is is not is going away and so when you're kind of trying to insert into that sort of story of positivity it kind of it's tricky because you're you're kind of clashing with the, the dominant tone and the expectations and even sort of journalists and, and to some extent policymakers i think suffer from this in terms of not really necessarily having faith in, in there being any sort of solution um whereas you know i think what, what often these heritage problems represent is a very different type of model to what what has failed on high streets as, as, as we'll talk about later oh okay that's probably a bit this is the longest bit of presentation in this you'll be pleased to hear um and yeah um what i thought would be useful just to do now is um you know taking what you can from that hopefully taking a few notes on things that that do or don't ring true um or things that you feel like need adding um and yeah what i'd like you to do now is just i'll put you into breakout rooms um and i'll work out exactly how many um with how many in you in each in a minute um but i'd like to spend maybe 10 15 minutes i'll i'll work out i'll give you a warning ahead of time um thinking of like just discussing you know your experience of the challenges which i'm sure you've all experienced the challenges of of uh trying to communicate and get across to people um why your projects are important or why heritage is important if it's a more general experience um yeah how maybe some of the things that i've just talked about have kind of manifested themselves in in just in practice in terms of people's reactions like what kinds of audiences have you found have been particularly difficult to engage or, or resistant you know also i suppose which ones have been very engaged and, and up for it from the beginning that's a useful to know as well i mean we're, we're on the the challenges side in this first session but i'm still you know still think it's useful to keen to hear where it has worked um yeah that's it really so your kind of experiences the challenges or otherwise and and um hopefully you'll get a very a chance to sort of briefly introduce yourself to each other in your rooms as well um, as I said before, I think just be aware of the number of people in your room and try and make sure everyone gets a chance to say something to begin with before getting into the the sort of the depth of the detail. Um, and, but yeah, hopefully 10, 15 minutes will be enough to, to kind of start to get into that. And then we'll come back to the main room. And um, yeah, I'll ask one of you from each group to feedback. Um, so that might be something to, to agree.
while you're uh, uh, while you're in the rooms as well is who's going to be back on the discussion. That all clear? Great. So just give me thirty seconds now to work out what I'm doing with these breakout rooms. How many people do we have? Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, apologies if you were that short uh, image flow. And there's always the possibility of that. And the, the, the messages that tell you you've only got a few seconds left, they're not very super prominent. Um, but yeah, hopefully I, I brought you back slightly earlier than, than than I'd said because I crunched the numbers a little bit. And I think that uh, probably it makes sense for us to just have a little bit more time now to, um, yeah, to hear back from each of the rooms and different from each other, as well as from the people in the room um, that you were in. Um, and also then to have a little bit of a discussion, obviously, if any of you didn't get points that you didn't get to raise as well, we might be able to fit a bit of that in. So we've got about 15 minutes now, I would say. Um, can I start by just getting any volunteers, people, things they'd heard from others in the rooms they were in that they found interesting, that they'd like to share um, examples or particular challenges or, or successes that people have experienced? I'll go first if you want. Please. So, um, well, we're now a room. We only had three people that were able to speak, unfortunately. The other two uh, had difficulties, <laughs> so we only had a couple of uh, chats there. Um, one of the things that uh, that became apparent is funding is obviously is, a, is an issue. Um, Rob in our group was explaining that some of these buildings are too big for groups to tackle. You know, they're, they're costing millions of pounds. Uh, so, of course, there's funding issues as well there. Um, you know, and on the high street, a lot of the properties now have become office space. So, um, you know, that that in itself says something if it's just office space. So we're losing a lot of community venues there. Uh, from my point of view, we've got an ideal community ven venue, but it, again, it's funding that's an issue. We're just about half a mile from a high street. and uh, My my building's in the, in the middle of a country park, but we've just been rejected for Heritage Lottery Fund in September. So we're still in the grieving period for that, but we have been strongly urged to reapply. So to take away from our conversation with the three people, also one of our colleagues uh, has a, she's in a pyramid uh, and it's still seen as a church. It was a former church. So one of her issues is to get people to look at it as a community building rather than just a church. Hopefully I've described that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And I suppose that, that thing of expectations that people have of buildings that they're familiar with is is one of the things that that can be a barrier definitely in terms of communicating um yeah when you're trying to kind of get people to see the vision of what you're doing just with that um anyone else got something they'd like to share or that they heard i'm happy to contribute for Ooh. my uh, group if you like to do. um we had a that's from from Brora up up in the, uh, the very north of Scotland down to Penzance. So, uh, yeah, we, we nearly had the Penzance to John O'Groats route in our group. Um, I think what, what we heard, there was a number of, of issues. I think I'll put in there straight away in the impacts of inflation. Um, so even though you've been really successful in, in, in your fundraising attempts to do different things, the impact of inflation is clearly going to be very challenging. And we need to think about how we communicate that effectively mm. um, and the impact you need around that I think the importance of relationships and um, some people had very clear relationships with their local community and that was a real strength for, for their projects uh, but then there's also the relationships and interactions with developers and how you get your voice heard in in that mix um, and uh, but we also touched on funding and and thinking about who who have been the new funders into the arena, particularly with the emerging funds post Brexit. Um, we all gave them different names, but essentially about levelling up and the shared prosperity fund and the growth deals. These are very much people with an economic development background and and being able to communicate those impacts of heritage into the economic landscape. And these are big big funds. Um, it, it, it probably needs a, a bit of development. So, yeah, there were some of the things that I heard and sort of take. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no, some, really, some important points there. I think about the challenges, like how do you, when you've got practical challenges, not just communications challenges, but how do they need to actually, you know, how do you get them across in a way that, that kind of doesn't feel 
pessimistic, but also, you know, is upfront. And I think you know, some of what we've, we found is that people do appreciate when, when you're upfront about those things. Um, yeah. And then interesting, you're right. I certainly, I think the sort of new, new types of funder and the different kinds of language that they're using, maybe the things that they expect to see things that they find persuasive are definitely a big part of this. Um, yeah. Um, Daniel, can I can I just add because I, I was in the room with Heather and um, Tim has a specific, Tim has a specific specific challenge in the fact that he's competing with four or five other different projects and he wants to get his voice out there over and above these other projects. So that's what he's competing against. And our our challenge is that the community is on board with our redevelopment project of this building for use as a community her heritage hub and, and museum. But, but as Heather was saying, the funding is going up all the time, or the, the cost increase is going up all the time. Your funding is not keeping pace with that. Mm. And it's getting the message over to the community that we are really working hard in the background, but nothing is happening on site. And it's been like that for years and years and years. Mm. And that's a particular challenge. So Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, that Yeah, there's a lot, there can be a long period when there's not a lot to show, you know, but, but behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. Um, Belinda, it runs up. Hello. Um, apologies. I was uh, my internet lost connectivity, so I missed the first feedback. So I do apologies if I if I repeat uh, what's already been brought up. Um, but uh, what the uh, things that came up in in our room was that um, the um, tension between um, reaching diverse audiences when you're covering a large area. Uh, where communities have got, you know, very specific cultural heritage interests, um, and then also trying to reach all those, but but trying to create also a coherent narrative for your area or your city, um, especially if you're covering both urban and rural areas and those communities and their individual needs and sort of heritage interests um, and that kind of thing. The other thing was, and this is particularly relevant to us in Exeter, is that um, we're one of the fastest growing cities in the country in terms of um, sort of development and the growth of our university. Um, and it's trying to, uh, and, and the, a local authority who seems very interested in the new shiny thing um, and not really um, recognizing the value of the heritage, the built heritage assets that we've already got um, and how you get your, um, your point across that these are worth investing in and also look using them as different sorts of spaces that can actually reach different communities with different needs and be very relevant and present and future facing and it's um it's trying to kind of get that across you know in exeter we have one of the longest intact uh, roman walls but you wouldn't know it from the city or how it's valued or promoted or amplified or anything like that and it's it's trying to kind of um bang your head against that really on a, on a regular basis so that's what came up for us yeah thanks yeah that's a really interesting example because i think um yeah it's surprising isn't it i think to come across the fact that these are sort of assets these are great advantages and you think why aren't they recognized by people who are trying to achieve things that would they would benefit um but there's something about them not being the right sort of style almost in, in a way that they fit into the sort of world view and i think that yeah that's that's the kind of on a on a um a kind of aggregate scale what we definitely saw and, and, and have heard from from individual projects it could be an issue um sally i think you had your hand up yes hi um this is um totally not my idea it was but it was something that i found useful that came up in our group session um with stuart catherine beth and rita and i think it was something that rita and, and catherine were talking about um mostly about sort of changing the narrative of uh, heritage buildings being not for profit in the in a way yes yes they are not for profit but also they need to um be sustainable and they need to become social enterprises and to make money in order to keep going um and i think the phrase that um catherine might have used was profit with a purpose which i particularly liked yeah, there's a, there is an important thing there, definitely about um, yeah. That I think that can feed in sometimes. You know, the, the desire to sort of get across that these things are being done for social benefit primarily, which is absolutely you know that they all are. It can sometimes reinforce the sense in which I talked about earlier of being them being kind of necessarily recipients of 
of charity and not able to, to provide any kind of economic or at least sort of self-sustaining um, income. Obviously, you know, it may well be that there are projects which do have a big, such a big social effect that, that benefit that they should be supported with, with grants and so on, certainly at the beginning, um, if not ongoing. But I think, yeah, it can sometimes underplay the potential of, of, of the, that the projects have to, to kind of emphasize that too much. So I think it's right to identify that. Uh, David. Hello. Um, I've got a, a, a specific communication problem, really, which didn't get a chance to discuss in the in the group. But if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just mention it here because I'd be interested to hear um, perspectives on it. Um, I just need to give a bit of context on that. So um, part of what we do is around Chartism, which was uh, um, about uh, sort of working class fight for votes in the 1800s. Um, we have uh, use of the Westgate Hotel, which is the site of Newport Rising, which is where 22 people were, were killed fighting for the vote. All right, uh, that's the sort of that's the heritage aspect. There was this whacking great mosaic in Newport City Centre. It was huge, and it sort of told the story of um, uh, all of that that fight and what it was about. Six points of the charge back, I think, and it was demolished by local council to build um, Friars Walk Shopping Centre. It's hugely problematic um it was handled very badly you know it was sort of we're going to get rid of this thing because we really need this shopping center it's going to be the sort of thing that unlocks the city center so that was that was a really bad decision um but um you know it was taken and unfortunately now what happens is when we try to do any sort of communication around chartism or you know any of the, the stuff which is you know what the charities and chest is about what we what we get is a lot of backlash about the mural which is clearly nothing to do with the charity we're not connected with in in any way and all of a sudden then the discussion becomes about bashing the council so it's sort of been politicized a little bit um you know so people are using it to bash the current labor uh, council um so and and as a, as we're connected with the charity who is sort of apolitical so we're about the the heritage we're about the political aspects of, of democracy, but never sort of party political. We have to do this sort of careful dance sometimes of what we can and can't comment on. And a lot of the time, some, some of the stuff, the events we do gets lost in the noise of this, um, yeah, this this um, bashing the current council over the head, who, you know, certainly aren't perfect, but um, actually aren't really connected with this story anyway. So how, how we, Get around that, um, you know, if, or if anybody's got any insight into um, how they might deal with a similar problem, I'd be very interested to hear. Yeah, and it sounds like a, I, I think I've come across similar issues like this before. I wouldn't say that I could provide an answer to that particular situation. It probably is uh, people who've dealt with it in more more depth than I have of those sort of situations, but um, definitely sounds familiar. The sense in which sometimes. Yeah, things can get to a point where in development of any sort is obviously very controversial quite often and people can can feel very sort of let down by how things have been done in the past and even if you've not been a part of that nevertheless any discussion of it any attempt to sort of engage people in, in that topic gets drawn into this and and yeah where you have restrictions like you said that that can stop you from maybe taking a stance in, in terms of, of, of your position on it quite as overtly and obviously relationships with the council and stuff like that can be a factor in that as well yeah I can see can see how that can be can be challenging and and you know I suppose the the, the very sort of general perhaps an unhelpful suggestion I can make this point is, is about thinking about how do you take the conversation into a space that's you know that feels like not part of that at all you know, is there a way that you can make it about some other aspect of what you're doing or some sort of activity where that just feels like a whole different arena? You know, that's a very easy thing to say, not an easy thing to do. But 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 I think that's often when you get into these sort of uh, divisive issues, you know, you, you need to not. Yeah, to try and change the conversation, you know, if you can. Um, but yeah, like I say, <laughs> easy, easy general piece of advice to say, but hopefully there'll be someone else here. Maybe you can connect with and might be able to give you some some uh, points on that one um yeah i think unless there's anything else has anyone else got uh, something they wanted to raise from the groups or a response to david potentially at this point i will move on to the second part of the presentation no 
Great. Okay. So yeah, we'll get through this one. I don't think there's as much to um yeah to cover as the last one. Oh well, arguably. Maybe there is. <laughs> but we're gonna get quite quickly into the first um breakout sessions again. So maybe we'll be able to kind of like pick up where you left off, although it'll probably be with different people. Um and yeah, the first thing we're gonna do is just um watch a video that uh we put together um as part of the work that we did with AHF, thinking about how we could kind of address some of the challenges that that we talked about in the first half. Um, so yeah, I mean, to some extent, I have to just sit there and watch this for two or three minutes. But um, what I'd like you to do as well is have a think about like while you're watching it, the different parts of it that you find interesting, the different bits that um, you think address some of the things that that we raised, or some of the points that you raised, what you can take from it. You know and just use it as the sort of conversation starter for when you get into your breakout rooms after this so i'll just get that set up and on screen now um yeah and the, the questions just so you can have a think about them as we go through are well i'll show you the questions hold on do a bit of fiddling with zoom to make sure you can see the video but yeah you know, it was was made about a year and a half ago, but so there's some little bits that might feel like a little bit like context moved on. But having watched it again recently, I think it, it's still, um, yeah, there's still a lot addressing the kind of bigger contextual things that haven't shifted in some cases have become more intensified. Um, yeah, but I'd just be really interested in in your thoughts on on how well it kind of speaks to some of the different challenges, how it tries to get over some of the the barriers that we've identified here and um yeah what lessons you might take from it or what things it might miss and definitely you know don't feel like you can't give negative feedback that's definitely uh welcome as well always useful on it um yeah so just a second you know, should be able to play this i just change the settings on zoom slightly make sure the sound works right yeah be aware that it might sound quite loud. I've noticed that on Zoom before the video as well. So, um, oh, that doesn't mind. Our high streets and common spaces face a moment of profound change. The era of identikit retail focused on short-term profit is coming to an end. Now we all face the daunting challenge of what comes next. But in towns and cities all over the country, an untapped power exists. The buildings that tell the story of our communities, those unique places of character and identity, could now help transform them. Unlocking this power is not simple or easy. It takes a special kind of partnership, with the right skills and motivation to make these projects work local people coming together with local government, businesses, charities and more. And there's a model for how to make it work. It's called a Heritage Development Trust. And they're already making an impact. In Great Yarmouth and in Coventry, in Sunderland and in Lancashire, pioneering people are using the HDT model to renew the places they live. What makes these trusts Powerful is the way they work. Across multiple buildings, pooling expertise and resources, communities of entrepreneurs collaborating and innovating for the common good. Out of the old, new kinds of spaces are created, with the principles and long-term view to support a new generation of projects and businesses ready to reinvent our centres. Abandoned department stores can become hotbeds of culture and entertainment. Local people supported to revive and upgrade libraries for the future. And closed bank branches turned into affordable housing and community space. Just when it is needed most, this model can lay the foundations for a revival in our common spaces and breathe new life into local economies and communities making every place somewhere we want to live and work. At AHF, we've seen the power and impact Heritage Development Trusts can have. We've backed the first few, and we're now supporting more. 
Our town and city centres are crucial to our prosperity and our health. Heritage Development Trusts can help create a new future for them and the historic buildings at their heart all over the country. Join us in making that a reality, in building a better future from our past. Oh, yeah, so I mean, there's a few uh, aspects of that that obviously, you know, um, are worth saying are not specifically going to be kind of the the things that you're looking to work with. Um, it was very focused on, it was like an advert for AHF to some extent, <laughs> they paid for it. Um, it was uh, very, very on, on Heritage Development Trust as this model that we, we sort of decided was a good focus for sort of like putting forward their approach to things. Um, and yeah, looked a lot of high streets, but hopefully within that, it also packed in a lot of other stuff and a lot of other kind of different ways of talking about these projects that you can see sort of um, responded directly to sort of the challenges we identified of, of, that needed to be overcome. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, as a just sort of a conversation starter, um, yeah, hopefully that was useful. And what we'll do now is just pop you back into breakout rooms. I think I will probably randomize them again. Um, and yeah you know again i would take a little bit of time to introduce yourself to people you've not met before um briefly yeah maybe talk a little bit make sure everyone's had a chance to talk briefly first each and then kind of yeah get into the discussion about what approaches you can take from that but also just generally about kind of the the positive approaches we might take going forward and then I'll, after that i'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about how we've approached these things and how we've approached things like getting uh, media coverage and other stuff like that so like taking a few more kind of detailed lessons from the work that we've done but i thought this would be a, a good place to kind of start your brains going about your experiences and, and then we can kind of share those alongside um yeah when we talk about more about the work we've done with hf Okay, welcome back, everyone. I think that's everyone now. Um, again, sorry if that was cut short very abruptly. Um, but yeah, keen to hear your thoughts. Um, yeah, definitely don't feel too like you have to stick to um, responses to the video. I'm very keen to hear kind of just more generally your thoughts about approaches that have worked in terms of uh, engaging different types of audiences or presenting heritage projects differently, different aspects of them that have been effective, that kind of uh, have got people excited and interested, um, have overcome some of the challenges that we talked about. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our approach that sort of informed that video and, and um, some of the other work we've done and, and the, how, we've, how we've kind of taken that through into kind of work with media and so on after that. Um, yeah, and then we'll kind of have a final discussion just to sort of wrap up. But yeah, any, um, Rita, I think. Hi, Daniel. Um, right. Yeah, I think it's, it's a great video. I work for HF. A lot of our work is is based in villages. So it's, you know, it's a more sort of city focused, I, I suppose, the Heritage Development mm -hmm. Trust. You know, this is a scale and it's very persuasive because it means it looks like proper development of a scale that people recognise as being development. And I think what we were talking about, or at least what I was <laughs> on about, was about the power of small and how do we convince, you know, uh, those up the chain, whenever you've got these big swirling pots of levelling up and other big funds, that the small projects connected together are part of the very powerful ecosystem. Um, and that's, you know, the, so I think that's a step into the room uh, with the players that the development trusts are a good vehicle and they are meaningful. But when you get to smaller towns and villages and individual projects and often trusts and organisations or social enterprises are leading on small individual projects in smaller places, you know, how do we get across that um, that the that, that small is powerful mm. yeah no, it's a good point i think there's potentially there there's there's the need for something similar almost in terms of a model it doesn't necessarily need to be something too too kind of uh you know fully complicated in terms of what what it represents but just to get across that there is an approach and uh that that brings similar benefits despite having unique aspects to it if that makes sense because i think Otherwise, you're trying to sort of amalgamate, as I talked before, lots of different, very unique projects. And then what you get in the middle is a sort of something that's not entirely clear what the characteristics are, you know, and you're sort of either putting in too much complexity at once or you're not doing justice to it. So trying to kind of come up with some sort of um, identity almost for what those those things are, that's been, a, I think, a powerful way that different um, 
approaches have kind of gained currency and, and got people to sort of see the benefit of putting effort into specific ones over a sustained time because it is I mean even for I think individuals in the public and local government and others it is sometimes you know a challenge to say well well why invest so much effort into this one specific thing if they can't see the connection with the things that are going on elsewhere and it, it is an example of something wider so I think whether that's kind of associating with some of the existing identities that are out there as well, because there are, you know, there are a number of sort of different models and, and approaches to sort of local economic development and so on that, that do exist. And some of those have been kind of, you know, popular in different different areas of the country and, and on a national level. So, yeah, I think that's that's possibly where I'd go in terms of of, of trying to get across the the the. The benefits of it but yeah there's maybe a specific question there about small village projects that don't fit as much into this sort of narrative of urban city kind of town development that the heritage development trust and high street stuff does um yeah not really an answer to your question but hopefully <laughs> i'm in this, this sort of direction anyone else have any thoughts they wanted to share from the discussion or that they heard just go straight ahead if you like Oh, Tim, I didn't see your hand. It's slightly blended into the background of your. Yeah, no, it's, it's here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so just actually one comment on a little bit of feedback. And somebody in, in our group, Susie, is developing a uh, building in, in Glasgow, um, which was formerly a church. And part of that project, if it's okay for me to say so, was to uh, is, is um, somehow to get change the identity of the building. So the build is a little bit like the chap in Newport. That, that it's like the project is a little bit because it was once seen as a church it's like everything has is a church and as she was explaining the various things that that may be going on there um i found myself suddenly clicking into uh the connection with uh the previous history of, of in glasgow of weaving and of fabric and it was like it was suddenly uh, a, a usp on that but on that um on that project, even though it might only have been a very small part of the whole the whole thing, and uh, that just led me back to the thinking of the uh, in the video what it says about unlocking the power of the story behind the building as a way of 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 connecting because people it seems people are, are keen to engage with history of towns or history of villages and, and a connection with the past and and we feel very secure with that. So any hooks that can allow us to feel comfortable with the past, but to move on to that, to what we want to do in the future, um, uh, are, it seems to me they, they are going to be, they're going to be useful. Yeah, that's a really interesting example, actually, I think, yeah, because I do, you know, sometimes what you want to do is lean into the history of, of it and kind of, um, yeah, you know, it's very obvious what it used to be and it's kind of just kind of retaining that identity and, and and adding something kind of quite neatly that fits with that or is the sort of development of that but obviously there are times when it's you're doing you want to sort of slightly change the identity of it and take it a different direction and I think your suggestion of finding a kind of alternative hook is a good one in that there's something that you know is, exists in terms of people's uh expectations of the area or knowledge of sort of what's happened in the area and you can kind of say well there was a bit of that going on in here you know so let's emphasize that aspect is probably the most realistic way of doing it because otherwise it's a it's kind of if it's too alien and new it can be hard for it to sort of shift the the, the expectations that people have so i think that sounds like a a good way to approach that particular challenge but but yeah the the developing the kind of the story that you want to tell and you know we'll talk about this a little bit uh, towards the end but i think there's a there's a benefit also i think we found to when the, when you're doing something surprising in a building to emphasizing that you know so if it's, a, if it's an old building that was used for something else and then you're using it for something very different now you know that's something that can often be uh, you know make it memorable and make it interesting and so bringing that to the forefront even if it's not the main usage and you know a lot of communications i find is about sort of being comfortable with being selective you know because mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 full complexity and you may know that certain elements are actually more substantial but that you you need to be comfortable with selecting bits of it that, that are actually the one and making those the, the the forefront even if you know they're not made the the as big a part of it and you want to tell the full story 
um, but certain bits can work better than others when emphasized. So, and it's kind of an example of that, I think that works well. So, um, Sally. Yes, hi. Um, <clears throat> I actually just thought of this, so it, it didn't come up in our um, group meeting, but I was wondering, just a question to everybody really, what kind of data are people using to inform uh, and drive their projects? Um, uh, very, very broad question, but I'm I'm just kind of curious. Is it stuff that you've collected? Is it stuff that you have any kind of regional or national um, surveys that you have access to? Uh, yeah, just open question, I guess. Any immediate responses to that? I mean, there's something you could always post into the, the chat as well as you go, if people have been thinking about that. Jane, I'll, I'll pass over to you and, and whether or not that's your, you're responding directly to that. But yeah, if anyone else has thoughts about the data they're collecting, suggestions, then do do post those, please. No, sorry, Sally, I'm not re responding to you, but we were cut off just as I was uh, in our breakout room, just as I was asking Rita if she could give us the website for Village Catalyst. She talked about this and I was wondering if there's a website that we could have if she could put it into chat. I'll send you a link to the HF's, it's a cross-departmental partnership, but our particular um, news piece on it, I'll, I'll send a link to that, okay? Great, thanks, thanks. so much. Okay, I think with that, what I might do is just dive straight into, I've got a few more slides to talk through and I expect they might provoke some more thoughts and, and feedback and conversation. I'd be really keen to hear that and save as much time as we can for that. So I'll, I'll get straight into that and then, yeah, we'll just sort of, have what I would imagine would be the last 10 to 15 minutes um, to sort of, yeah, talk through any kind of of your thoughts on those uh, additional suggestions you've got or any any kind of specific maybe challenges that you're having that it might be worth trying to to give some feedback and input on from the group. Um, yeah, so just give me one moment. Yeah, so just kind of going back to, I suppose, the film, but but also maybe the challenges that are identified in the first part of the workshop um, and thinking about kind of when we put together the strategy as a chef, we obviously, you know, there are various different ways that we looked at approaching them, but, but three of the kind of core things that we saw as ways of kind of getting past the barriers that that we'd identified um, are kind of summarised here. So I'll, I'll talk through each of these briefly. Um, so I think the first thing, you know, this was connected to this sense in which it was people didn't think that heritage was part of these bigger conversations. And so um, and it wasn't necessarily a part of the kind of economic question um, and their kind of I suppose their assumptions about that as a barrier meant that if you just came straight in and said this thing is this, that was going to be tricky for them to sort of process up front and so what you had to kind of I think we felt like was an important way of getting past that was to say we know you don't know this that this is a sort of unknown and untapped wealth it's something you're not aware of you know that we, we you don't need to sort of um there's a reason you don't know about it right and then you're kind of giving them almost like permission to 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 recognize it as a new piece of information um, and also it gives that thing of being, I know people always like that idea that, that there's something hidden that they they weren't aware of that could be a really strong positive benefit, which obviously for I have for a lot of sort of local councils and others are at the moment are thinking we're lacking uh, resources and, and, you know, what do we do with all these different challenges that we've got? The idea that there is something there that they didn't know that they had access to. It's true in a lot of cases, but it's also like, I think, making sure that that's part of the way you're presenting it, that, that, that it's something that has been neglected, that has been missed, um, and that it's a kind of untapped opportunity there. So that was kind of one of the things we've made relatively central when we've been doing a lot of our communication. Um, the other, I think, was dealing with the fact that, you know, there was a lot of kind of pessimism and a lot of like, um, yeah, a lack of kind of faith in in what might be possible in, in, area, in the area of high streets, particularly, but, but also with sort of heritage buildings in each area. And so, you know, our approach to this really, you know, is quite straightforward in, in a way, which was, I think, you have to get to the root cause of why people are pessimistic and and be 
if you just approach things by say it being too just sort of blandly positive straight away kind of saying everything will be great this will be a world success it doesn't ring true for people in the climate in which they're receiving these things and so i think getting into the kind of teeth of like how will this be a different type of thing that will 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 work in a fundamentally different way to some of the the things that are failing you know and really spelling that out was a way of kind of getting past the sort of the the, the sort of blanket negativity that there can be around the topic um, and so you know in the, in the case of us putting forward why is it that, that um heritage buildings run in a different way could be different from other things on the high street you know the fundamental thing there is that they're often they're, they're allowing different types of projects to succeed because they have a longer term view and they, they'll charge less in rents you know and obviously that on itself is not the basis for success but it, it does give people a sense in which there's a real attempt to engage with what what has not worked about the model of, of high streets as, as it has been and then the final aspect of it that we kind of talked about uh, tried to kind of bring was like you know in terms of, of getting past the the not necessarily the idea that, that the heritage was relevant to high streets was not only to say that it is but to make it kind of relevant to more than that to kind of add other aspects to it so you know we kind of directly made the connection with things like leveling up um with debates that are going on about kind of national identity where we could as well and kind of heritage's role in that and and sort of or almost kind of reach for the stars in terms of not just aiming for for like why it's relevant to this thing but it's relevant to this and other things and then that kind of you know if you don't if you don't hit your target in terms of all of those things being seen as as part of it it still brings the status of the conversation up to the level where it can be taken more seriously so those are sorts of general principles that we thought about in terms of our our that went into the video and kind of informed our communication priorities uh for this going forward um but you know from a, on a very practical level i think one of the things that we've we've worked on a lot with ahf and where we've seen a lot of success and sort of it's validated our approach i suppose to this has been in getting kind of media coverage and and that you know the transition from our success on this and um, before and after the strategy and like the principles that we established there i think it's really sort of as i say kind of gives the sense that they are they do make sense and they are working um and, and you know we've had a number of, of big sort of national pieces of coverage now we've sort of been on um been in the guardian in the times uh mirror um i think been twice we've been on on you and yours i think on radio four um and in various other sort of smaller outlets as well across time and you know they've had different focuses but i think what we've what all of them have probably had in common is tying into a kind of something that's happening at the moment that's a sort of topic of ongoing concern and with high streets that's often been dialing into a particular kind of building so every now and then you'll get people talking about kind of um bank closures or talking about department stores closing down or other things like that um, and the idea that those are being used for interesting new things instead and having two or three of those examples to share on its own has been a really we found to be a really effective way of kind of getting the attention of a journalist because that just is in the structure of the sort of story that they would tell which is this thing is happening this unexpected other thing is happening in connection with that here are three examples. Here are three people that you can talk to and who will talk about it, who are interesting people with personalities, you know, that, that come across. And that that sort of basic structure has just been very, very effective in in um yeah, in, in getting across what we were trying to, which is the sense of, of sort of progress in this area. Um so a few points on the right there that I think kind of are worth kind of considering in terms of your own projects if, if sort of media coverage is is helpful which i think it generally can be and um, if you're trying to kind of look at uh, whether funding or other things you know having that can kind of build status um so i think you know the, the obviously there's always a, a a desire to kind of have that kind of trajectory of of like what have been things that you've overcome on in succeeding whether those are on a personal level or in the project as a whole you know and, and and the kind of like no one thought this could be successful or it was in this terrible state and then it became now it's doing all great things you know so i think identifying that and sometimes people don't they feel like they shouldn't go on about that in a way <laughs> and talk about it too much because it's not that bad and they kind of came over easily but again you know what communication is about is almost 
you know sacrificing how you you would do it yourself and thinking about what would work on on the level of like of the organization um yeah i mean i think as i said earlier there's a thing of the contrast of like what people expect to be happening and what people might think a building would be used for or what kind of people you might expect to be using it or that sort of thing you know i think where there's something that's unexpected there's something that contrasts with expectations there that's always a good thing to to bring forward to sort of make the headline um you don't have to start with with the sort of the detail of the building that can come later it can it can be sort of much more the people um, yeah, and that translates through, I think, into like, are there individuals? Not everyone wants to put themselves forward, but, you know, it's a, obviously a cliche thing to say about media, but the media loves stories and they love talking to individuals and even quotes. You know, one of the things we've done recently about some youth led projects is, you know, even before we describe anything to do with the project, we send the first thing we're going to put in the, the thing we're sending out is the quotes because they're so good from a young person about what it's meant to them you know so that that's we don't even say what the building is but we say what the effect of the of, on the young person is in their own words and who they are you know because that's a surprising thing and then um you know that there's an opportunity to talk to that person as well which is something you know if you've got access to people who are interesting unexpected people who have been impacted positively by your work and you can offer them to be interviewed that's a very attractive thing for a journalist to see and so i think bring that up bring that forward make that obvious and then you know that's the hook that gets them in to then tell the story of the of the building and what you're doing as part of it um yeah i suppose the, the you know the stories of origin stories of persistence and impact that kind of links back to some of the things i said before um and i think it is yeah trying not to give too much information is often the the challenge as well when you're going first contacting into a journalist so you want to just try and think about what are the two or three things two or three simple things you can extract about the building that are interesting about the project rather not just the building about the project about the people involved about the impact it's had what what things are those can you extract and just get those across and just say would you be interested in finding out more we can offer you the opportunity to talk to this you know that can be the thing that, that gets them across and then leave out the sort of all of the detail and the other stuff that maybe isn't as as interesting or takes more time to explain and come come later um so yeah obviously it's a different challenge as an individual project going to maybe local media or going to like different places as case studies but you know you have seen actually recently um we've seen uh you know sort of individual local projects get some really nice coverage in national media that was nothing to do with us and was just through them being very savvy operators in terms of explaining why their projects were an example of an approach to tackling a particular big social challenge at the moment in you know whether that's sort of seaside towns or or commuter new commuter towns and the trends going on in there or, or other things so I think if you can think about how your projects are one aspect of how things are changing in a particular types of area you know talked about villages and we talked about high streets a little bit and different types of town you know like what kind of a town is it in what kind of a village what are the people they're doing that's different how is that a part of a big national trend you know you know find some journalists who've written about that send them an email saying you might be interested in this and they might come back to you in six months or you know it can happen and I think if you give them just the nice the simple information that shows this is a case study and as I say offer them the opportunity to talk to somebody with an interesting background or, or can tell them about it um yeah so hopefully that's a, a useful sort of just summary of like how we took those lessons through into how we've done media um we also did quite a few other things you know uh, as part of this and sort of took those those principles through into it so you know we produced sort of more kind of explainers that kind of in a different graphical way kind of showed this was particularly I think looking at kind of local government audience like how can this HDT model in this case have an impact across a different town center what kinds of different buildings is it have, have the, those sort of projects um done different things with in one sort of simple accessible way um you know thinking about national um influence we you know we've held a couple of quite big 
I'm going to say it were big, but they were sort of high profile in the sense of the people we invited, you know, sort of CEOs of different funders and big sort of people within national government um, to speak. In fact, one of the speakers of the last year, I realised, has now been appointed as as the Deputy Chief of Staff at number 10 last week. So um, I don't know whether that gives us a line in uh, to, to national decision making now, but um yeah, you know, a, a mix of people who are examples of, of what we were trying to get across and then, you know, a, a framing of the event that they felt comfortable with. I think it was about, um, you know, post-pandemic recovery was the sort of topic that we focused on. And then sort of heritage was kind of the role that heritage could play in that. Um, uh, yeah, and I think so. So I think if you are looking to have kind of build your status locally or build your kind of um, connections locally, holding events around a shared topic of interest where you know you're one of the speakers maybe or you're kind of convening people with interest in how we look at the future of our area in this way you know and on online events can be a relatively um yeah they don't have to take a huge amount of effort to organize and if you get the framing right you know you can really build gives you an opportunity to talk about your project in in more detail and kind of and put it in the context of sort of what it can achieve um yeah, and then we produced other things, different materials and explainers and and and, and a kind of toolkit for different um heritage development trusts to use as well. Um but yeah, I think I'll just finish off by talking about some of the sort of major principles across the different things that we did. Some of these will be repeating myself, but hopefully in case you kind of missed them first time around, um, or if they sort of summarize them in a different way. So I think, you know, again, it's it's a simple point, but it bears repeating about personal stories, you know where whether it's in the sort of building's origins and who was originally working there and who was originally in that space 100 years ago or whatever or, or used it or you know how the process of development has gone and who's been involved in that from where or or the kind of impact that it's had particularly on people um you know those things are worth collecting whether that's through just some initial quotes or, or videoing those and they can be a really, you know, a really great place to start from in terms of, of whether that's communicating with policymakers or funders or or others. Um, get that thing of, of of thinking about how what you're doing is part of, you know, it, often there are all sorts of different types of impact that can be good in like ten different ways, but like the ones that you probably want to prioritize are the ones where it's you can link it to something that's kind of of contemporary. Um, interest that people are they're in the headlines you know the, the ones I've mentioned there are sort of cost of living and energy prices those are obviously you know, it's difficult to say how many hundred buildings are going to kind of directly address those problems they're already suffering from them rather than addressing them ne necessarily but I think putting them within the context of that um maybe like I say within things like kind of hybrid working and, and changing patterns of work you know there are things that are longer running as well as the the kind of contemporary crises there are things that are going on over time like high streets like changing nature of work others that that can be i think people there's always a an interest in in how how we develop those and the kind of people who will be making policy decisions will be interested in those funding decisions um look at what what the funders and, and policy makers that you're interested in are talking about is a good a good start for that um yeah i think going back to some of the stuff we talked about at the beginning about you know directing where people have kind of worries or misunderstandings that people um about what's possible or, or that are kind of getting in the way of, of being positive about this stuff i think it's good to direct them like really straightforwardly and provide evidence um for that you know and not not just sort of attempt to gloss over those with sort of just a positive take but but to actually be, you might think this, but actually this, you know, in terms of um, the kind of project that you're running or or so on. So I think, you know, people sometimes expect, and I think that's come from the way that maybe heritage projects and 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 sort of charitable projects tend to take a very sort of like positive only kind of approach to communications where they'll just say everything is fantastic and great and isn't it wonderful and like, you know and they won't really address any concerns and they won't really you know like that whereas i think that there are people would, that that will stand out to be more kind of open and transparent and i think you know this this links into this next point which is that you know there's a there's a tendency in heritage and, and traditional stuff which i think is natural to take a kind of quite 
austere kind of approach to, to communications and to be sort of like quite sort of sensible and I think you know to a level it's not to say you kind of go off the charts in terms of doing crazy stuff but I think you know being a bit more irreverent and being upfront about challenges and mistakes and, and difficulties and and not only when there's like a crisis and you need help but like on an ongoing basis being a bit more kind of like less slick sometimes well, maybe slick's not the right word but like I think yeah just just I think people like to see that it there's there's that, that there's like dilemmas and difficulties and then they're trying to you know to see inside that it's a challenge and as it's ongoing um and that can be a way of like bringing people into the process as well I think um as you go um rather than kind of just pretending everything's going smoothly throughout at every point yeah and then the final point I think is just that um it's important to sort of like you know sometimes we miss because we're all in the middle of something to the, to kind of restate the benefits of these things in a very basic way you know sometimes it can sort of jump past those things and I could, you know think that the word heritage itself or whatever conveys something to meet people but actually you know to a lot of people it doesn't mean anything really it's kind of hard for people to understand what that means so like so I think coming back to stating in as simple terms as possible what the actual good things are about what you're doing and not forgetting to do that which I think can often be the case is, is an important one as well and like sort of summary concepts and terms which we use to sort of define the sector that we're part of or like okay we're all just doing this thing you know they're not meaningful and powerful in the same way as like it's always good to think about how would I describe this to someone who knows nothing about it without using any of the sort of jargon or terminology and then use that way of describing it in your communications because it will be more powerful more likely yeah so there's some sort of just a few summary points in terms of um the presentation today um yeah just to finish off then would love to hear anyone else's kind of thoughts that as they've been going through things they've heard in the discussion suggestions um to add to those yeah and then we can kind of uh wrap up for the day Amanda hi can you hear me yes oh brilliant sorry I'd had to uh, log out and log back in because I was having trouble with Zoom um yeah it's been really really interesting so my background is I've got um a background in construction but also um in in law and um managing project I'm also doing um, a master's in conservation at UCLan currently and what I found is whatever sort of side I was working for, whether it's for architect, developer, contractor, or homeowners or building owners, um, that there was a massive um, lack of true communication. So one of the one of the main things that I do now is specialize in construction mediation. And I always think with things like this, that people have talked, I've been reading group chat as I was obviously trying to log back in and sort my laptop out but that where people talk about um, not being able to make the other side understand or be heard, or it can become a little bit conflict. And I think sometimes it doesn't have to raise to necessarily conflict before, you know, the mediation can come in and be the go-between because sometimes we don't want to say things to the other side that if a third party is saying. Um, and I just, I just think it's interesting that it, it comes up time and time again. And when I've obviously read through, um the, the chat and I think you know with with what you've just talked about on the the slides and I could hear um I think it was Greg when I was in the one of the breakout rooms um talking and I just think it's really really interesting that we have these beautiful uh buildings and and high streets that, that need regenerating and such and some of it can come down to um a lack of education a lack of understanding and and ultimately a, a lack of communication but thank you for today it's been really good no worries thanks for that Amanda yeah that's really interesting to hear the experience of um yeah uh, of, of dealing with those sort of conflicts as they arise and, and, and where that comes from got any other thoughts you want to add as uh closing thoughts before we head off no thank you very much um that was really great Daniel. Daniel, yeah yeah well thank you, thank you. I, I hope it's been, I think these all, you know in a couple of hours they can only hope to be sort of thought-provoking I think is the most you know to do rather than giving any kind of comprehensive answers but yeah I hope you can kind of take some of that way and, and, and sort of come up with different ideas things to try out 
you know, as much as anything else, because it's very rare that obviously in different contexts, there's lots of different things you're dealing with and different kinds of audiences and, and so on. So, so yeah, um, my email address, I'm sure can be shared with you. I can, I'll stick it in the chat now. Um, and yeah, very happy to have a chat or if there's any kind of specific issues you'd like, things you'd like feedback on or whatever, do you feel free mm, to drop me an email? Um, sure with that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> That'd be brilliant, yeah. <laughs> I, it's, I find it nice to work on stuff where it's just a matter of like feeding back and thing and it's not, you know, mm. and, and I'm not being contracted to do anything. So I'm very, I'm always... Yeah, we've got some good videos and stuff. I'd love you to see and Village Catalyst and stuff. It'd be really interesting yeah. to get your take on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to. And yeah, any so any any specifics or, or questions, things coming out of the presentation that you wanted to double check as well. Um, yeah, very happy to, to to follow up on that stuff. So yeah, just drop me an email and um, yeah, otherwise... Uh, enjoy your afternoon <laughs> thank you so much daniel that's been really interesting obviously a topic that many struggle with so that's been absolutely spot on um just to remind everybody that it, it has been recorded so if you want to share it with any of your colleagues um i'll i'll be sending the link out it'll be in the next couple of weeks once we've we've edited it but please do go on to toolkit i have to keep reminding everybody it, there's so much information there um it's a real gold mine um if you've forgotten your login details or you don't have them do get in touch with me but thanks again daniel that's been brilliant and thank you everybody for joining us this morning see you at the next one thanks all all right bye <laughs>